Good morning to everybody from Delphi Economic Forum. We're very happy to be here and uh, with a thematic pillar with shipping and the future challenges for shipping. I'm Danae Bizantaku, CEO of Navigator Shipping Consultants and concept founder of Yes Forum, the Young Executive Shipping Forum, and it's a great pleasure to moderate a shipping panel for one more year. I would like to thank the organizer, Mr. Simeon Tsomokos, Yanis Tomatos, Stella Tsomoko, and all the great team that they're bringing us here in the center of Delphi for, a whole, for all these days. This is the third day. And of course, that they trusted me to moderate two panels. Taking into consideration that we're opening these discussions, we would like to share with the audience that approximately 90% of the world commodity trade in terms of capacity is seaborne. While the global fleet increased by 67% during the last decade. Specifically, Greece ranks first globally in ownership of merchandise vessels, presenting a 28% increase in owned capacity in the last five years, while the average vessel size is almost double, which indicates that Greek ship owners mostly operate in high volume markets. Also, recent data show that Greek ship owners are heavily investing in growing their fleets with new buildings, maintaining the average age of Greek-owned fleets lower than the global average. At this point, it is useful to underline that Greece represents 0.15% of the global population. Shipping industry faces new trends and challenges something that we will discuss here today related to the development of technology, the new legal framework and regulations regarding decarbonization, the crisis of human element on board and ashore, following the pandemic and the sanctions due to the war, new trading patterns and energy needs. Allow me to emphasize the fact that our distinguished panelists depict the whole spectrum of merchant shipping, given the fact that we're hosting companies owning container ships, bulk carriers, LPGs, tankers, as well as a ship management company. I don't want to take more time from our speakers, so I would like to introduce you. George Margaronis, CEO of Latsco Shipping LTD. Thank you, George, for being with us. Stamati Chadani, CEO of Synergy Maritime Holdings Corp. Thank you, Stamati. Alex Hajipateras, Executive Vice President of Business Development of Dorian LPG. Thank you, Alex. Jerry Calogerato, CEO of Capital Product Partners. Thank you, Jerry. Costas Contes, Managing Director of VSIPS Greece. Thank you, Costas. And George Girukos, Managing Director of Technomar Shipping. Thank you very much all for being with us. And I will start with Jerry. We're constantly reading about decarbonization in shipping, alternative fuels, etc. Once or twice every decade, we're reading, speaking, and discussing about new regulations that most of the times only ship owners have to pay in order to comply with. All relevant regulations are driven by the climate change, due to which we have to implement faster than the others. Do you think that this is the same case for decarbonization? Could you please tell us about the challenges, opportunities, and enabling actions towards decarbonization? Thank you, Danai. Um, I think the question of decarbonization is uh, going to be one that uh, we are going to discuss um, for the years ahead. But to put this uh, into perspective, when it comes to shipping, as you correctly pointed out, um, it's a very effective means of transporting goods. Uh, we transport 11 uh, billion uh, metric tons of goods, almost 1.5 metric tons per person, given the current population. Um, but at the same time, when you look at the environmental uh, uh, footprint of shipping, it's less than 3% of man-used greenhouse emissions. So it's not really only economically efficient, but also a very, a very environmental friendly way of transporting goods. It's already that. Um, and then you have to put this into perspective in the sense that when you look at manufacturing, that represents 30% of greenhouse emissions. 
electricity generation, 27%. Uh, even growing plants and animals, that's 20% of greenhouse emissions. So shipping is really uh, very efficient. However, as you pointed out, uh, climate change is here. Um, in the Mediterranean uh, nations, uh, we have seen uh, many climate change induced calamities, floods, wildfires last year. So every industry has to uh, pay its dues uh, and do what it can do best uh, to reduce uh, its environmental footprint. But for shipping, given the size of vessels, uh, as well as the um, volume of the cargo, there are no easy solutions. Uh, in passenger transportation, we have electrification. This doesn't really work for shipping. Um, the latest electric containers are out there. When you compare them to a conventional uh, uh, container, for example, a conventional container can carry 200 times the cargo of an electric container and, and cover 400 times the distance. So it's not a viable alternative. When it comes to shipping, liquid fuels uh, will be with us for the short to medium term. Potentially in the longer term, there will be all other technology advancements like carbon capture. But when you look at liquid fuels, conventional fuels are so much cheaper than alternative, alternative fuels um, that something has to give. And there is really a number of solutions that are being discussed. Today, we're discussing about ammonia, methanol, uh, biofuels. But shipping does not work in a vacuum. Um, typically, when we talk about decarbonization, the focus is on ship owners. What are ship owners doing? But in reality, for a ship owner to be able to use alternative fuels, you need the ship builders to offer vessels that can use alternative fuels. Ship builders need engine makers and manufacturers to manufacture engines that uh, can use these alternative fuels. Then, even if you have the ship, you need the infrastructure, and more importantly, you need also uh, the supply of these alternative fuels. So what I'm trying to say is that in the end, shipping decar decarbonization is not just about shipping or ship owners. Um, there are many links in the chain, and nations, governments, as well as supranational organizations will have to play a significant role in getting all stakeholders, including charterers, uh, who are the ones that benefit from the transportation of goods, to contribute in getting the R&D that we need, to get the innovation that we need, so that potentially um, we can use these alternative fuels in the future. And ship owners, as you correctly pointed out, will follow. Um, we have ordered a number of ships. Greek shipping, for example, has really uh, managed to replenish its fleet and has a very modern fleet. We have um, LNG, which is a viable alternative. It reduces greenhouse emissions by 20, 25%, and there is the infrastructure. We, have, we are using as dual fuel. Right now, 35% of the existing order book of the new ships to come will be using LNG because it's a viable technology. So I think what we really need to see in, when it comes to decarbonization is all stakeholders to play a significant role. Very important what you say, all the stakeholders in the same table. And thank you for mentioning this. It's very, it's very important to find how the new the vessels must be built to, uh, to be... Uh, in the seas and to be environmental friendly, of course. George Girokos, fuels and technology. Which fuels and technology technologies will best ensure vessel safety and competitiveness towards shipping's energy transition? Yes, thanks, Dana. As Jerry covered very well the, the subject, I will say that uh, right now no one knows what's going to be the next fuel. There is various options like biofuels, all the way to nuclear power, you know, all in between. The question is not just which engine that will be produced to burn this fuel, but more the logistics. For the containers, it's far easier to bunker the ship, you know, to put fuel on the ship, because you know the schedule of the ship. But for the other types of uh, ships like tankers and bulk carriers, especially bulk carriers, the, it's more difficult where the ship is going to find the fuel. So it's a matter of finding the right fuel, producing it economically, because some of these uh, alternative fuels require a huge amount of electricity, which make it you know, really 
not that viable because if you're going to use so much energy to produce energy, then at the end of the day, the footprint is a, is a holistic approach. Uh, and then you have to, to make sure that whatever fuel you use is also safe. Ammonia, there is questions about safety and handling it on board. Um, more, more likely, in my view, is uh, in the foreseeable future, we will see carbon capture mechanisms for the existing fleet as, uh, as a magnitude. Some people say that in order to uh, change the whole, f the whole fleet into the new technology, we're looking at $3.5 trillion. So it's a big investment. Won't come for the next, I think, one or two decades. Uh, we will not have the whole fleet all completely changed. So I think that we have to all start to think that goods that are going to be transported will have to carry this uh, cost. Uh, in order for the fleet to change. We will have more partners of shipping that they will analyze the shipping of 2030, 2040. But yes, it's very crucial uh, until 2030 what we will do in order to cover the regulations for 2050. George Margaronis, a lot of discussion about sanctions. In which way sanctions affect the tanker companies? So just the put things into perspective slightly. Uh, Russian oil uh, accounts for 10% of, uh, of seaborne trade. Uh, 3.2 million barrels a day are transported of crude and something like 2.3 million barrels of, of products. Uh, half of that ends up in the, in the European Union. So the sanctions have had quite a significant effect uh, on a, on a micro level, I would say, short term, what we're gradually seeing is a change in trade flows, uh, gradually away from, uh, from Russian products and, uh, and more to come, okay. uh, and more to come from, uh, from the US, from the Middle East and other areas. Um, so, so that's something we're seeing already. Obviously, the US and Canada have prohibited uh, the import of uh, Russian oil altogether. The UK has committed to gradually weaning itself off Russian oil uh, by the end of the year. The European Union has, has made noises, but nothing specific. So we're gradually seeing this, uh, this change uh, in, in trade flows. Uh, that's a positive, obviously, for tanker owners because it increases ton mile demand. And, and that we're already seeing as having a positive impact on rates. Um, I'd say additionally, the fact that much of the uh, Russian uh, fleet or Russian owned or controlled uh, tank fleet uh, is, uh, is sanctioned or is, is having problems trading is, is another reason, uh, a secondary reason potentially for, for an improvement in tanker rates. Uh, but going forward, I think the fact that we are now clearly in, a, in, a, in an environment of high energy prices is a reason for concern uh, and a concern for tank owners as well, because this is likely, if it persists much longer, to basically lead to all demand destruction uh, and higher rates of inflation. In turn, that will lead to higher interest rates and potentially uh, low growth rates, which again is detrimental to, uh, to tankers. Um, now, we're, we're also, uh, as a tanker company, facing challenges on an operational level. Uh, and they relate to things like uh, the uncertainty of war risk insurance and what the premiums are likely to be uh, for a particular call. Um, things like uh, logistics that relate to uh, the difficulty in sourcing Ukrainian crew because of the situation in the Ukraine. Uh, even on a more human uh, side, the coexistence of, on some ships of Russian and Ukrainian crews uh, does is something that... It, you know, is a sort of, is, is a challenge of sort. But I think the major challenge we're, that we're facing is really trying to understand uh, what is being sanctioned, who's being sanctioned, what trade is being sanctioned. Uh, and that's not entirely clear. Uh, measures are taken or, or announcements are made or almost on a weekly basis. Uh, and, and it's extremely time consuming and expensive to seek legal advice in terms of what one is permitted to do and what one is not permitted to do. I think the final point I would make is, is, is that of self-sanctioning. Uh, and we have faced challenges. 
with people taking it upon themselves to, uh, to take a position in terms of whether one trades to Russia uh, or not. And uh, f as far as I'm concerned, at least, you know, if it's legal uh, and we need the oil in Europe, and God knows we do need that oil to land in Europe, we need to be pragmatic. Uh, we need to be pragmatic and to let the owners uh, do their job and not to interfere really with the uh, ship's operations. I will keep that the European Union must be more shipping oriented uh, because it's, it's very important to have European Union into the dialogue and understand the meaning of shipping because Greek shipping controls 20% of the worldwide trade and 60% of the European trading. So it's very important to uh, to understand it a little bit more. Alex, how can smart technologies and systems help shipping companies maximize their efficiency and profitability? What are the drivers and barriers that shipping companies are facing according to your uh, opinion? Where Greek shipping stands at the moment uh, um, from your perspective? Thanks. Thank you, Danai, and I'm delighted to be here, and I thank the organizers. Uh, I would like to start off by echoing some of George's points about uh, Russian and Ukrainian seafarers, first of all, because although we're talking about the future of shipping, uh, it's a very real, uh, live, breathing problem that we face today with uh, mixed crews. Uh, we can't separate the crews completely, so we're working very hard with the vessels to keep uh, the situation calm on board. And in many cases, it is better than it appears in, in the firm press. So. Just to, to comment on that, that when we talk about human element, it's a very real life problem that we face today. Um, for smart shipping solutions, I think that the, the good thing, and we're in a global economic forum here based in Greece, is that the ecosystem has started to develop significantly here in Greece with new companies sprouting up, uh, doing uh, different parts of the supply chain to digitalize them, make them more efficient because shipping has heavily been a very paper driven industry. And um, finally, tech has caught up with shipping, so they've realized that there's time for a disruption. I think that the challenge for us is there's a plethora of new companies, and it's who do you work with, how do you work with them, how do they integrate, and also there's still an issue of connectivity from on board the vessels. Uh, we cannot get the data as rapidly as we would like, and, and there needs to be some standardization there. But I think if we develop the talent pool, and, and I think Greece has a very strong talent pool, that it's an area that can help us bridge between uh, what Jerry and George were saying in terms of reaching this decarbonization target to have more openness and transparency and be more efficient with how we manage our vessels. And to add that also now uh, there's more focus on the safety side and, and commercial as well when we talk about smart shipping too. Because there is a great competition worldwide about uh Technolo new technologies in shipping from several start from the startup community, and they must understand that. Uh, and this is a little bit awkward that uh, shipping uh, is controlling the 90%, as we said, of the global market so of the trading. So they must be very careful of what solutions they provide uh, uh, in order to be uh, easier for you to to use and for the ship owners. Seafarers are key workers. Costas Contes. There is no one in shipping that could deny this fact because during the pandemic, seafarers were probably those who, have, who were affected the most and those who kept the world go round. Two years after, due to the war, they're facing again challenges. Could you please describe us the current situation and actions taken by companies in order to solve these difficulties that are arising? Thank you, Danai, and thank you for highlighting the importance of the seafarers. I don't think we we all understand how, if you are not in shipping, that uh, seafarers is the essential part, is the lifeblood of our industry, is the backbone of our shipping, and uh, they should be treated well in order to be able to transport all the goods that we have today. So, um, shipping without the seafarers would not have been there. So, just just to to highlight the importance. Um, it's not that COVID has gone out of the picture because of the war. So COVID restrictions are still there. The issues with uh, changing crew members uh, when they are due or 
efficiently. It's not that it has disappeared from the picture. But on top of that, we have now the war. Uh, you know that uh, the Russian and uh, Ukrainian pool is more than 16% of the global uh, CFRS pool. That means, and especially for the industry of the container market that we have I discussed also with Mr. Yukos before, it's even worse uh, because majority of the CFRS are coming from those from those countries. So um, the, there is a significant issue that uh, uh, requires attention. The companies, luckily, the private companies, individual and private and public companies, shipping, com shipping ship owners and managers, have taken positive uh, actions very fast. Uh, when, in the case of the COVID, because a lot were related with international organization, they were not, they did not move as fast as they should have done. Uh, here we have seen owners taking actions, you know, uh, helping, uh, first of all, focusing on the well-being of the seafarers on board the vessels. They have given access to free communication. They have looked at their uh, nutrition. They have brought uh, um, uh, mental health on board the vessel when and if required. At the same time, they have focused back in their home countries uh, uh, to look at the families of the seafarers that they were looking at uh, at an immediate solution. We have, as an office, uh, as, a, as an organization, set up special offices up in, uh, in the borders between uh, in Poland and Romania. At the same time, we have had a special team, team here in Greece to be able to accommodate families. Uh, and then, so that they, so far as they feel comfortable, that we look after them, and then they can, they can continue their work uh, uh, going back uh, to the ships. Um, we looked at also how to pay them, you know, the e-wallet solution. Uh, with the sanctions and the difficulty in the, in the banking system currently in Ukraine, you know, all these people, they were looking at getting their money cash on board. That is a dangerous thing to happen. So we have looked at electronic solutions, assuring them about their money, about their, um, how to support their families back. And then, uh, at the, and then the last thing, uh, which I think is important, is that uh, uh, we have run behind uh, making a, a, a partnership with ITF, making sure that ITF is uh, behind supporting those essential workers, making sure that the essential workers understand so the, the community understands that those are essential workers and, 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 and find uh, a way to support. Uh. Because shipping does not have a specific country. I mean, uh, this is the problem. It's not local, it's international. So this causes big problems. Thank you. Stamati, supply of coal. What are the biggest challenges we're facing at the moment due to the new trading patterns? What are our energy needs, choices, and possibilities? Well, thank you, Danai, and uh, thank you for having us today, and congrats for the panel. Um, coal has been demonized uh, the last uh, 10 years, uh, and uh, the problem is that all the coal mines have been completely underinvested. So now with the emergence of need of the use of coal, it's kind of impossible to restart all these uh, coal mines. And uh, Russia uh, has been exporting 50 million tons of coal to Europe on an annual basis. Now, with the sanctions and the self-sanctions of many parties, all this coal needs to be replaced from longer hauls. And we are seeing that on a daily basis, where you see uh, longer hauls of uh, coal from Australia to Europe, from Colombia to Europe, the United States, and so on. So. It has re-emerged, and um, I think that the war has been a very tough wake-up wake call to see how much dependent we still are on the energy needs. At the same time, coal is not just for energy. You need coal to make steel, and steel is completely necessary for the infrastructure projects all over the world. You know, all the developing nations need steel. So it's kind of a, you know, a fully mandatory uh, raw material in the uh, whole supply chain. So we're talking overall iron ore and coal at 2.4 billion tons a year uh, transportation. So it's, it's, it's a humongous uh, part of the global infrastructure and energy needs. And, uh, you know, with the emergence of all that and uh, all these new developments with the war and stuff, I think that it's going to be problematic and more expensive 
and this is going to create a big, big energy deficit in the world. You know, uh, according to the Wall Street Journal, the seaborne coal transportation is undersupplied by about 20%. So think about that. I mean, it's it, it's a massive uh, problem and a massive deficit, massive deficit in uh, in the global energy mix. So we are still reliant on that. There's still uh, a lot of um, um, uh, there's still a lot of way to happen before the full transition into the clean energy. And until that happens, we are unfortunately very much reliant on you know this kind of fossil fuels. That's all I can say. This is it, it, it's very important what you say and uh, the, the construction and uh, the energy projects all over the world now. It's it's a big boom of all this. So. Uh, the next day will not be easy to decide how it will be the next day. Jerry, I will also ask you about the war because there is a big impact of the Russia-Ukraine war uh, in the world energy map, as also Stamati said. But uh, how Greek shipping can assist with providing Europe with energy security? We recently heard also about the, the deal of USA, uh, Europe, and uh, how it can help. I think the repercussions of the Russian invasion to Ukraine uh, on the energy markets are going to be with us for many years. Um, they have completely transformed the way we see things. Russia uh, has painstakingly built a reputation over the last 20 years as a reliable supplier of energy. Uh, let's not forget that uh, it is um, the um, second largest uh, natural gas producer and um, the first largest when it comes to exports. Uh, it's um, uh, really uh, the, it competes for second and third position with Saudi Arabia when it comes to oil production. So it's a very significant uh, country when it comes to, to energy exports. And uh, the idea was in the post-Soviet era that um, uh, Russia would be a responsible actor. With the Crimea annexation and definitely the Russian invasion, uh, this picture has been shattered into a thousand pieces. Suddenly, um, all nations, and especially the European Union, that have been dependent on uh, Russian energy imports uh, to cover their needs. Um, Italy and Germany are two, uh, two examples. Um, Germany uh, really depends on Russian uh, imports for about one third of its energy, so quite significant. And uh, importantly, 60% of its natural gas imports are from Russia and through a fixed pipeline. Um, they realized that uh, pipelines can be weaponized. Um, and Russia was really betting uh, on those energy exports in order to be able to force uh, the European Union um, to stay put and not interfere with uh, the invasion. So suddenly, uh, Europe realized that Russian exports are not reliable. And in a way, unwanted as well. There is a lot of uh, popular opposition, uh, given also the atrocities that we see uh, in Ukraine right now. Uh, there is, uh, even though the European Union allows uh, imports, uh, energy imports into the EU, there are a lot of uh, uh, organizations that, uh, that self-sanction because there is popular opposition. So energy security is significant. And how do you secure energy um, security? How, how do you go about it? The EU has a very significant asset. It has the floating pipelines, which are SIPs. Uh, let's think about LNGs, for example, which is natural gas being one of the primary concerns. So EU uh, nations, uh, EU-based companies control about 25% of the LNG fleet. Uh, about more than two-thirds of that actually uh, is out of Greece, Greece-based companies. Um, and these are the ships that right now are bringing uh, LNG, liquefied natural gas, into Europe. So uh, I, was, um, I was having a discussion the other day and somebody said, yes, but you know, these belong to companies and uh, some of them are on time charter. But uh, yes, of course, but do think for a moment, do the mental exercise. If this floating pipeline 
that is the LNG vessels, were controlled by Russia or China, how would we feel today? So I think the EU will need to recognize that the shipping industry, the LNG industry, uh, the LNG carrier industry, but the wider shipping industry is a strategic industry that needs to be preserved, um, that uh, it needs to be supported, including its tax status, including supporting the shipping services uh, community, which is very important. Um, and um, the, the turmoil that we are facing right now in energy markets, I think it's uh, going to force us to look um, into that direction. George Girikos, how sanctions affect the liner companies? Well, the nature of uh, trade of containers, it's uh, like a bus. You have a bus where people go in and out. It, the ship never empties and never fills up. In every port, you pick up cargo for some port in the, in, the, in the liner service, in the trade. The ship goes between specific ports around and around. So obviously, that creates a big issue for uh, having a cargo on board that suddenly becomes sanctioned. So in this respect, liner companies are taking a view of uh, self-sanctioning well before to take the risk of uh, you know, having a cargo that they would have to deviate and uh, you know, offload because it's sanctioned. So of, obviously they're not going to sanction ports, that's the obvious uh, result. But apart from that, the liner companies are, are more sanctioned than uh, the others in order to avoid this issue. If you have a tanker or a bulkier, you know where you're going to pick up and what you're going to pick up, and if it's sanctioned or not, you, you know what you're doing. In a, in, a, in a liner business, you might end up having sanctioned cargo on board without having control over it. So that's what the liner companies are doing. Generally speaking, uh, you know, sanctioning cargoes also is, uh, is an issue of humanitarian. So some cargoes that contain you know, medicine or food have to be transported, and these cargoes are transported by containers. So these cargoes are not sanctioned throughout the years, not just in this war, but in other wars with uh, Iran, Iraq, and all this. Thank you very much, very important. George Magaron, it is a fact that uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic have changed uh, our lives and our everyday life. I believe that now we are uh, a, a facing a rethink of our approach towards remote working. How is this depicted on the shore personnel? So I was, I, I'm one of these people that I think when the situation gradually started to, to normalize, I was absolutely hell-bent on everyone coming back to the office. I think probably in part because during lockdown, I found that a really difficult period to cope with uh, from a communication perspective, just communicating on a one direction, on a one dimensional level with everyone through a screen or on the phone. Um, I found that particularly challenging and even awkward sometimes. Um, bringing in uh, newcomers to the company, I, you know, during that period of time, my eldest daughter started work and I remember the, uh, the challenges that she faced um, you know, starting in a new company as a, as a new member of a team, not being able to turn up to the office, not being able to, to talk to people uh, face to face. And I think one of the other things that we lost over that period of time was the sort of small talk or the informal talk, the brainstorming amongst us. Uh, and that all brought a, a, a real fatigue, I think, uh, to many. Not, also, I would say also the, the, the erosion I felt the gradual erosion of corporate culture. That was another challenge. So, but I think I've, I've been probably put under a bit of pressure by my colleagues to rethink uh, my position. And, and, and we're actually in a phase where on a trial basis of, of two quarters, we're going to go with a sort of, uh, a, 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 let's say, a hybrid, um, a hybrid solution. Obviously, it depends on, on the role people have in the company uh, longer term. But uh, that's something that I, you know, I think we've we've got to maybe uh, think again about. And, and although I was uh, very much against it, I think you know that was more driven by my own personal experience rather than uh, 
the way that uh, my colleagues and, and, and the employees of the company feel about maybe having a little bit more flexibility uh, to not work from home, but work not work not from the office. So, you know, that would mean basically working from wherever they are. Uh, so, yeah, that's... We usually say that in shipping you never know everything. Shipping needs brainstorming, and brainstorming cannot be done online, and the exchange of views of all the people in the office. So, yes, I, I also believe that we need to be face-to-face -face like we are again this year, and we're very happy. Alex, I will, I will take this uh, discussion to say that still, that uh, what do you think that is missing from smart shipping solutions? You are monitoring many smart shipping solutions, but what do you, where do you believe we must focus on? Um, so the, the investment is there. This is going to be a $320 billion market by 2030. And you see companies like Microsoft investing in, in Nautilus, so it's gone mainstream. What I think is missing um, is when you look at people and processes on the other side, you can have the best solution in the world to help you reduce, I don't know, your uh, consumption daily. But how do you uh, get the insight from that and then translate that to top management? Sometimes it's like you need to hire a data analyst to interpret what the platform is giving back to you. So I think that from a user experience and adoption standpoint, there has to be some development and uh, evolution on the use case internally with shipping companies to kind of connect the, the dots there. And then I think as we see sensors and artificial intelligence becoming more mature, we are reluctant as ship managers or owners to put new hardware on board vessels. I mean, very, very uh, sensitive about that, touching the vessels. but you know, with the second-hand vessels, we are looking, in, in some cases, of doing that, for example, to improve navigational safety. Uh, and, and you see the new building, the shipyards, incorporating some of these technical solutions into the platforms that they use. So again, you need a standardization. I mean, I think there's hundreds of companies now. But uh, both talent and then a kind of, let's say, improvement on the processes, the functional flow, that, that would help in the future derive the benefit of, of these solutions, specifically with regards to reducing consumption and planning how you move your ships more efficiently. Very important. Of course, as at this point, we have to underline that uh, those 150,000 seafarers were the key catalyst to the establishment of the Greek shipping miracle. What is your opinion about the young generation of seafarers and uh, what you would advise a young student that would like to follow CFR's profession. This year we have many young people also in the Delphi Economic Forum. And what the companies need to do today in order to secure CFR's safety and training, which is very important. Can I start, can I start with my concern? And my concern is that we are going to export the know-how and the knowledge to other continents. Uh, we, I mean, Greek shipping, as you said, has been based on the Greek seafarers, on the charisma that we have in managing, in the, in the know-how, in the emphasis that they are putting on, on the troubleshooting. And, um, uh, and I'm, I must admit that uh, my concern is that, you know, with less and less people going at sea, Greek, uh, officers going at sea, that this will become uh, a critical uh, path for the future of the ship management out of Greece. Um, I think that we need to escalate and have a light the benefits and advertise. The Ship Owners Association has very light, highly, very nicely, has gone out and made a campaign to highlight the importance and how how the, 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 the benefits of, the, of, the, uh, of this profession um, the income that is unique compared to an equivalent work ashore, uh, with the issues, the nostalgia about uh, their home uh, and, the, and the difficulties, but you know, with the benefits and the future highlighted back in the in the office ashore. If someone is very good, you know, there is certainly a position uh, at uh, at a certain. Uh, part of his uh, career 
to come ashore and support the offices. So I think all these benefits have not been very highly uh, clarified. On the other hand, I think that uh, uh, the government and the European Union has to give incentives uh, because, yes, we know that, uh, uh, you know, keeping Greeks on board the, the vessels uh, is an expensive uh, outfit. A lot of, uh, you know, it's not an easy for a lot of owners that in the past they were operating in marginal incomes uh, to maintain. There are few and proud to say that they are keeping the, the Greek officers and the Greek flag, but there has to be an incentive so that this incentive remains there, not for the short term, but for the long term in building and maintaining a pool uh, of seafarers that they will support and they will maintain the future knowledge that we need to have here in, uh, in Greece. We also mentioned it in, uh, they also mentioned it in a panel of tourism before. We must bring tourism and shipping more into the schools. The young Greeks, they have to learn about the shipping history. Of course, they will choose if they will follow the shipping world, but uh, it's, it's very important. We have such a great history, and uh, I, I am speaking to, in the schools the last 10 years, and uh, they, they are very happy to find out that Greece is number one in the world because even many Greeks do not know this. So it's, it's very, very important to maintain the, to, to em, em, emphasize the importance of the Greek ship owners and, of course, of the Greek maritime cluster. Stamati, how are we going to reduce emissions on the current fleet? I think that this is the, the, questions of, or the question of the millions or billions. <laughs> how can we achieve this in the next five years? That's, um, that, that's a great question, Danai. Well, just to put things into perspective, dry bulk shipping in particular is transporting iron ore, coal, grains, uh, soya beans, fertilizers, so commodities and raw materials that are absolutely required for the infrastructure, for energy, for feeding the population. So we're talking about fundamental stuff here, right? So come to think about it, about two-thirds of the global dry bulk fleet, that's about 7,000 ships, have been built 2012 and earlier than that. So you cannot possibly replace 7,000 ships in the next five, six, seven years. It's, it's kind of, you know. So I'm not sure that people have really thought through what they're trying to push into um, the global shipping community right now and to the owners, you know, the ship owners. It's, it's kind of impossible to replace 7,000 dry bulk ships and God knows how many other tankers and stuff. So it's kind of a crazy thought altogether. What you can do is that you can make the existing fleet a little bit more efficient or sometimes, you know, quite more efficient. We have been installing energy saving devices and we have been investing heavily on the existing ships to make them more efficient. And there are ways, there are solutions, custom made solutions for every ship that is not necessarily the so-called eco ship. At the end of the day, the best solution is to slow down. If you slow down the global fleet, it will eventually, you know, emit less and less CO2 and greenhouse emissions. So a combination of slowing down the fleet as well as installing sophisticated energy saving devices and new technologies, um, like it was just said, I think it can make the fleet more and more efficient, less carbon intensive. It's not going to be carbon neutral by tomorrow, but it's certainly going to make a big, big impact. So a combination of all these factors will continue to make the cost of transportation for infrastructure more, I'm not going to say competitive, but it's going to be better for the end user. And the end user is, you know, a loaf of bread or a bridge or a house or things that, you know, need to be produced with the things that we transport. So having all that in mind, energy saving devices and slowing down is a solution from now until 2030. Very important. And uh, because we finished the round of the discussions and we are on time, we will not steal more time, but I want to, uh, to address you a question that it's a little bit weird, but I would like to hear it. Let's assume that next year we are the same panel again, exactly the same. 
what you would like to achieve in the next 12 months with what, how can I say, different uh, opinions, I mean, or different uh, results, uh, how you would like to come back, what you would like to achieve in the next 12 months and come back here to uh, the goals to accomplish and come back and share with us, Jerry. I, I think we have um, touched upon all uh, the main topics that are um, at least in my, in my mind. Firstly, I think we should make steps um, in terms of decarbonization. This means uh, adopting new technologies. This means um, investing in uh, new uh, ships, new buildings. We currently have uh, a program of excess $4 billion uh, under construction across different segments. Um, and hopefully also get uh, more stakeholders um, to, uh, to play along and have a, a more clear path and framework towards decarbonization. That's one. Secondly, I think digitalization, very important. We need to make steps, uh, as Alex pointed out. There is a lot of progress being made. Shipping uh, was, is only now catching up, and I think uh, it's going to, to, be, to radicalize the way that uh, we do business in the future. And, and thirdly, I hope that we will have the COVID crisis behind us. Um, we talk about seafarers as, as um, frontline workers, but nations um, do not treat them in that way. We still face um, like a, an endless um, 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 list of policies, restrictions, um, um, and, and so on uh, for um, crew members uh, who are really only uh, trying to get home or get on, uh, on board the ship in order to, to service um, um, the worldwide trade. So we need to solve the, this issue. It's, uh, in a way, it's a shame that we are two years uh, into this and we are still uh, struggling with that. Alex? I'd like to improve uh, further the, the gender diversity in shipping, talking about the talent pool for seafarers. So we're building uh, female officers and cadet pool. Like to progress the company on the ESG journey, like I've talked a little bit about S and G, to really align kind of the purpose of the company with uh, some of what we're trying to achieve and, and the profits we want to generate. And uh, to George's point about being on in person, I think we need to visit the vessels more, which we haven't been able to do before, and, and get a handle on, on their condition uh, which we've been doing remotely as best possible, but now we can do in person. Costas? Yeah, I think uh, one year is, is, is a short period uh, to waste something very big, but I think normalizing our operation, which we have been struggling for the last three years, uh, as Alex said, you know, getting on board the vessels, meeting our people, uh, and eventually for the, first, for the next path is having a clear path on the decarbonization. We don't know tomorrow, tomorrow what will be the fuel, how to train our people, and what our seafarers should be uh, trained with. So this, in one year, we should clarify that this will happen. Stamate? Well, the last few years, um, we've gotten um, used to saying, you know, health and uh, peace. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want this to sound like a beauty pageant uh, <laughs> Q&A. Uh, in my opinion, Yes, we need to normalize our operations again, both at the office and on board the ships. I fully agree about our crew members that they need to be able to, you know, get on board and leave the ships as quickly as possible. Most importantly, for the next uh, few years and especially the next 12 months, a better plan for decarbonization where all the stakeholders will be fully, fully part of that. Because right now, there's an absolute, you know, disarray in the views of... Uh, you know, what's going to be the thing of tomorrow, whatever that is. So a better plan, in my opinion, and above all, you know, health and peace. And peace. George? Well, our industry in containers has been uh, great for the last couple of years, so I, I'm happy with that. I don't want uh, more, uh, you know, more money. I just <laughs> want peace. Uh, I'd like, to, you know, people to have... Uh, you know, no more war, so our seafarers can focus uh, on, uh, on, on their business and not to be, you know, afraid. It's a horrible thing to be afraid in work. 
and uh, also I hope that the, the various organizations will uh, settle this issue with decarbonization because right now it's still in the air, who's going to pay what and all of that. So that will give us certainty on how we move ahead. So these, uh, these two are my wishes and uh, of course health for everybody because that's without it. Very important. I would say from my side, as uh, Stamatz and George uh, said before me, just the return to normalcy would be great, not to have to worry about wearing masks and, and being able to, you know, just, just return to what life was not, not so long ago. Uh, and from a business perspective, what I would say is, is I'd like to see uh, our industry uh, embrace the younger people more. I'd like uh, shipping to become a place that is uh, that lists highly on on industries that young people um, want to uh, want to be part of. I think we we need to work quite hard to understand the younger generation. Uh, you know, we we find it well, my generation at least I think, and I speak for most people, I do find it challenging to understand uh, today's 20 and 25 year olds. They're a very different breed to what we are, uh, and rather than uh, us trying to make them fit into our world, I think we need to sort of try and, you know, talk to them and think about what, what it is that uh, they want to do and where it is they want to take things. Um, and, you know, that's, that's really uh, something I'd, I'd look forward to seeing. That. So we have many things to do for Absolutely. the next 12 months. I would like to thank you very, very much for honoring me with and us with your presence and let's work on all these subjects and uh, uh, try to make uh, to find solutions thank you very very much